Thanks everyone for coming out. Um, I'm really excited to have Dave Stewart here. Um, and, and I think this is going to be a, kind of a fun night. Got a couple more clips to go through. But um, yeah, so I wanted to, to sort of start by asking, um, sort of by way of, of introducing you, what was, um, what was your sort of your trajectory coming to, um, to write games and League of Legends? Um, and sort of how did you end up being mm. the executive producer for something like the NALCS? Yeah. It was really a series of happy coincidences that landed me at Riot Games um, and, and put me in the position where I am now, which I, I really love. I think it's a great, it's a dream job. Um, but, I, but I wasn't on this trajectory for, for you know, uh, a long time. Uh, my background is in sports broadcast. Uh, I worked in um, sports uh, at Fox Sports for many years. Uh, and then I also worked uh, in entertainment. Um, I worked in comedy and, and product placement for Time Warner Telepictures for a while. And it was actually there that I, I made some relationships. A lot of people tell you that relationships are everything, and, and they really are. But um, there were a few uh, critical relationships for me uh, at Telepictures. Uh, three people, and specifically uh, Drew Levy was a very uh, influential creative influence for me. Um, my friend Mitch Rosenthal, who's here tonight, uh, has been my logistical partner for the last 10 years on, on many projects that I've worked on and really has helped on the operational side. And then finally, uh, Barb Sherwood is a, is a director and she's a friend of mine. And she, at the time, was working with Riot Games uh, on, a, on a new project that they were working in in eSports. Um, they were doing both the, the World Finals and some other things. And she kept telling me that, Dave, you would love this. This is amazing. It will blow your mind. You will be stunned by this. And I think it was largely due to my background in sports, as well as my passion for video gaming, that she thought uh, this would be something that would interest me. Um, and it was right around that time that Riot had had um, a very big success with the World Finals, uh, the third World Finals at Staples Center, uh, where a, a young star named Faker uh, came to Los Angeles with SKT. I see we have some Faker fans. Um, Faker has fans all over the world, and he's a great player. Uh, at the time, he was an 18-year-old kid uh, who came to America, won the championship against a Chinese team car called uh, Starhorn Royal Club. And at that time, uh, Barb had been telling me all about this, and, and uh, one of my favorite shows, I very much enjoy sports documentaries, one of my favorite shows is called HBO Real Sports with Bryant Gumbel. Um, and I was watching an episode of this, and they did a segment on the World Championship, uh, on League of Legends, on eSports. And I was very, very fascinated by it. Um, and I started playing the game. Uh, I've always prided myself on thinking that I can learn about anything if I put some effort into it. Uh, but this was actually really easy because I do love gaming, and I, and I fell in love with the game right away. Um, Barb put me in touch with a producer in New York who's worked with Riot for a while. His name is Ariel Horn. He had worked at NBC Sports for many years, uh, doing Olympic coverage. When we spoke, uh, I really felt like a, a kindred spirit in that a lot of my Fox Sports background and the Super Bowl coverage and World Series coverage and things that I had worked on very much resonated with him and we started a conversation. And he recruited me to come to uh, Riot and come to the LCS and I can't be happier that, that I did. This video that we watched was very nostalgic for me because uh, it was less than three years ago, um, which is like 30 years in real life. Like things fly and pass and, tr and just transpire so quickly in esports. Uh, so much of that I, I was there for, I was around, we were doing the broadcast, we were very engaged in it. Uh, that team, it kind of skipped a beat where they lost in the semifinals. And when they went to New York, they were playing for the third place match. And they, and they did end up winning. But a documentary followed this where that team really went through some very challenging times. Uh, and, and they had a long road where they almost got kicked out of the league. And, and if ultimately, uh, they just won our spring championship in Miami a few weeks ago. And it was such a, a great story for this organization. But of those players uh, that you saw, um, how many of them were on the team, Liquid, that just won the championship? Yeah, zero. Uh, the owner is still there, uh, the coach, Mark Z, he's an analyst for us now. Uh, some of the players have moved around, Phoenix. Uh, he is on Echo Fox and was in Miami for a third place match. He's got such a great personality, um, and, and he's so fun to watch, and, and I enjoy listening to him when he's, when he's telling his funny stories. But I, I also am impressed by the pressure on a, 
on a kid like that who's 19 years old, living in America, uh, you know, is very, has language hurdles and other things that um, there's so much pressure on these guys and many of them perform very great, you know, gracefully under that pressure. Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, I think that's one of the sort of the operative questions here and it's one that I, um, that I really want to kind of explore, you know, more deeply, the sort of the, the, the pressure and the, the speed at which this thing has, has changed and grown um, and it, you know, it, it, it does to sort of to look at this, this documentary almost seem like kind of looking back at a, at a time capsule. Um, and I think, you know, part of, part of what makes eSports so interesting is that it's, you know, it's at, at one level it's, it's very familiar. Um, and it looks a lot like, you know, like the, the sports that people know, but I think it's also, it's emerged so quickly and uh, and so sort of so, so, so power, powerfully that, you know, the people who don't, don't know much about it um, often kind of wonder what is the sort of the nature of esports as a, as a kind of sport. Um, and I think it's, you know, somebody with a, with a background in sports and now sort of moving to work in, in the field of esports. I'm curious, you know, what you sort of think about the, uh, the emergence of something like esports and, and how it sort of it, it differentiates itself from, from something like sport and, and maybe elaborates on it mm. or, or yeah. Yeah. There, are, there are some very interesting similarities and very uh, interesting differences. For a long time, there was a, a big conversation about whether or not professional video game players were athletes. And many people waged that conversation. And it reminded me a lot of uh, conversations that we would always have in the newsroom at Fox Sports where people would be arguing about whether or not NASCAR, NASCAR is a sport. You're just driving. I, I drive to work every day. I'm not an athlete. Like, how, how can these guys be athletes? And there's this kind of like bias against certain types of sports as opposed to, as opposed to others. Um, I never really waged in on this uh, too deeply because it, it doesn't, it's irrelevant to me in a certain degree. There's a uh, intense competitiveness about these players. They play at a very high skill level. It requires split second reactions, great communication uh, and composure uh, in the midst of an adversity and single split second decisions. And so I, I so much respect what they do. Um, the, the second part of your question about like, uh, you know, of the physical space versus the digital space, um, that's one thing we challenge, we're challenged with in the media. Um, when I see Cristiano Ronaldo score a goal and run and, you know, do the airplane, like, that's very visceral. He's there, there's uh, thousands of people behind him. Whereas, you know, in a video game, like, you are sitting there, you're at a PC, you are intense. I love watching them communicate. I, I have the uh, access to their team comps, so I'm actually listening to them a lot while they're playing. But uh, like we get some of those reactions, but getting that, uh, that like pro element into the storytelling, into a digital realm is a, is a challenge that's very unique to eSports. And it's one that's exciting, but it is a, it is a very, uh, you know, it is a, it is, a, it is a very big difference. These guys hurt on the inside. Um, we haven't had too many injuries like related to like, you know, semifinals, you sprain your thumb and you can't make it yeah. to the finals. So that's a big distinction between, uh, you know, sports and, and eSports or, or digital sports. And so there's that. Um, and then uh, I think one other big thing is, is the practice. I think you saw some of the stress in that video that the team is dealing with. And in physical sports, you can practice for two or three hours or whatever your body has limits for. And then you go into film room and studying. These players have scrim blocks, uh, you know, that will take them 10 hours a day. And they're playing six days a week, 10 hours a day. And then they have a game the next day. And many of them are also playing when they're done with their official stream blocks. And so some of the limits that they're pushing as far as their, when they're turned on is a real challenge and it can lead to, you know, some, some burnout uh, on occasion just because the, the schedule is so rigorous. I, I'm curious about something that you, you said um, just a minute ago about the sort of the, um, you know, the, the s speed with which esports has emerged and, uh, you know, and, and again, kind of thinking about this video as a, um, you know, it's almost a sort of a, a historical look back, even though it's just a few years old. Um, why do you think? Why do you think now? Why do you think esports has you know has has become this um, you know this, this phenomenon in the last you know what seems like the last ten years? Mm. Although obviously it's older than that. Um, 
even even those that may not be familiar with esports, like we all know people who game and we all know people who play games. And I think that's a built-in audience for esports. It are the players of video games. And so there are so many video game players and that we're able to see people playing the same game we do at a high level. That's already uh, an audience that's there and it, and it drives a, a deeper engagement with the game that, that people play, with the game people love. And so I think that this is this has probably been there, the opportunity has been there for a long time, but only in, in recent years. Um, and, and, you know, we talked earlier that it's been, you know, a few decades now that esports has been around. Started very grassroots and now it's, it's kind of growing and, and expanding. But uh, in broadcast and in sports uh, landscapes, you know, producers and, and those that create content are always looking for audiences. Esports has a built in audience because there are millions and millions of gamers who are fascinated by, intrigued you know, by the product and are interested in it and want to take that engagement to the next level. So, you know, so as, as you're sort of thinking about how to, you know, to, to take something like esports and, and translate it for, uh, for an audience of, of players or fans who are, you know, who are, who are really into this kind of media, into to video games specifically. How do you think about, you know, translating video game play or, or, or competitive games into something that's, you know, that's compelling for an audience or compelling for an audience to watch? Um, I think just the competitive spirit. Like there, there are moments in a game where something is about to happen. In, in League of Legends, it's, a, it's a, a multiplayer online battle arena and there are moments in the game where objectives are fought over or critical moments and like there's that excitement. You want to see the outcome. You want to see whether or not this player is able to steal that Baron like Piglet did in that one clip. And like y you become invested and you see, you see the great stories uh, that, that kind of transcend um, different mediums of sport, but like you see the great stories of like the victory, the defeat, the, the, the agony of all that work wasted. Um, and, and it's also interesting because many of the audience that we deal with sometimes are not like core sports fans and, and from that background and are kind of shocked by some of the things they see that when a player fails and he's crying on stage, like we'll see a lot of times where, you know, we'll see in Twitch chat or Reddit threads or feedback that you shouldn't show that player when he's sad because that's mean and, and it, like it's very hurtful. Um, to me, like I want to show that, I want to see that. And it's not that I'm trying to uh, burn or hurt the player that's suffering because he just failed. It's because that story. The next time I watch that player, I'm going to want to see him do well because I'm invested. I saw him hurt. I saw him fail. I want to see him overcome that. And like, I think that that is the storytelling. And like, there are so many opportunities for, you know, that story in, in esports just due to moments in the game, uh, the stories of the pros. Uh, we ha it has come a long way, but like, uh, I love the LCS pros. They're like very like they're great players. They've got good personalities. They're they're it's a very also very meme culture. It's very uh, fun and interesting and like these you know it's it's different than kind of the the main fair that people are getting in in sports and it has that built-in audience that this is I feel like there's a connection that this is something that's ours. Yeah. I play this game. This is this is something that's ours and we kind of have an ownership stake in it and. And that is uh, kind of enriching. Yeah, I mean, I, that is kind of the, the sort of the fascinating thing is you, you, it seems like you, I mean, even in, in this, this documentary we just watched, that you, you see these, these narratives emerge and grow and, and you know, and something as, you know, as, as emergent or, or young as, as esports to sort of to see these, these legacies and these histories sort of build up and accumulate is, is really, you know, is really, is really fascinating. Yeah. Um, so the next clip that we're, we're going to watch is, um, is from a series uh, promoting worlds. It's mm. episode four of, of Eyes on Worlds. Um, and I think it's interesting, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you about this when we, when we come back from that clip, to, to sort of think about the scale through, through mm. something like this. And it's, um, I don't know, it's one of the things that's really fascinating, I think, about esports is the sort of the, the, the scale and the reach of, 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 um, of this media phenomenon. 
in broadcast, we would call this a great tease because now we're anticipating our next clip and it's going to be awesome, but it is. The scale and the global nature of it, I think that clip captures really well. This is a, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Eyes On series, you'll see it. These are some documentary uh, uh, filmmakers that I have, I've always feel free to brag about them without being braggadocious because they're my friends, but I don't touch the work they do. They just take the things that we do and they make it really high level and I love sports docs. And so uh, these guys do great work and I'm excited to watch this clip. How big, how big was that crowd? Uh, that was uh, just over 40,000 people uh, attended live that day. Wow. Um, and uh, it's the largest crowd we've had. We, in uh, Sangam World Cup Stadium in Seoul, uh, we had just under uh, that, the, what our peak was in Beijing in 2014. Um, but it was, a, it was a spectacular crowd. Uh, it takes a crowd that big a long time to get into the venue. It takes a while to get everything set up and, and ready to go, but um, yeah, that was a really exciting show. That's a huge production. Yeah. Uh, we have, um, it was broadcast in over 20 languages. We send out a broadcast um, that, that all of our regional partners take, and so uh, there's the Chinese broadcast, and there's the Korean broadcast, and CB Lowell in, in Brazil, and so it's, it goes to many partners, and it goes throughout the world. Um, it was, it was a huge crowd and live attendance, but the viewership was also r really amazing. I'm, I'm curious, you know, for, for a while it seemed like, you know, people thought, you know, thought c cable would be the sort of the, the point at which esports would, you know, would achieve legitimacy or like that that, that was what it was going to take was to, sh mm -hmm. to show up on, on ESPN or, or something like that. And, and, and while it has, it, I mean, is that... That's not really the sort of the primary way that, that esports is, is distributed in the world, is it? Yeah, uh, it's not. Um, it's interesting. Like what, that was one of the first questions I asked in one of my interviews to uh, Dustin Beck, who at the time was running esports, um, and he's since left us. He's he's a, a great, very charismatic uh, leader for us. But I asked him, like, uh, do you know, is the goal to be on Fox Sports or ESPN or on Cablers and uh, he said no. Like he, he was adamant at the time that we didn't need that for legitima legitimacy if we're getting the types of numbers we were on streaming platforms such as Twitch or, or YouTube. Um, and yet at the same time, like that's never been a no. Like I think as uh, the landscape evolves, like what the right uh, platforms are will also evolve. And I think that um, you know it's it's many esports are trying to figure out. Uh, that that picture right now. I know that um, uh, Turner Sports, who you know does E League um, and some Street Fighter, they were recently nominated for uh, an award, and the the award was actually for best cross platform usage because they have some things on on TBS or TNT, uh, and then other things are being streamed via Twitch. And so uh, I think there there is a possibility for multiple platforms being involved in, a, in an overall strategy to you know, get the content to the people, the people that want it. Yeah, and, and s where are those people that want it? Uh, well, I think a lot of them are playing uh, League of Legends. Um, we find that like, you know, many times it's a two screen experience where you might be playing uh, while you're watching or having it on in the background. I know that I was playing some games this morning uh, and I was listening to some of the MSI play-in coverage from Berlin. Um, and so that is a way to, to kind of like take it in um, but it, it's, it's mostly on the internet, uh, you know, on, on Twitch, YouTube are, are, you know, pretty big platforms. And that's where, that's where people are finding it. Um, we don't want it to be limited to if you have a certain cable subscription or, you know, something like that that might be a, 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 a barrier to entry. Yeah, it's, it also seems like it's, you know, it's, it's really international. And, I mean, and just looking at the sort of the, the players that are the focus of this, of this, of this piece, but also, the, you know, the audience and, and where it's it's taking place, it seems like uh, like esports is circulating pretty pretty widely. Yeah, uh, it is, and I think for anyone that follows uh, league closely, like the Koreans are the best. Uh, that was actually the first time a North American League Championship player has won a World Championship because Core JJ uh, went back. He came to America and he played a little bit. Then he went back and became a World Champion. Um, but it is, it's. Uh, the game itself, um, you know, the large, largest percentage of the player base of the game is in China. 
Um, much of the viewership is, is most robust in China, um, but, it, but it's global. We have partners all over the world. Um, when we were in uh, Brazil last year for our mid-season invitational, um, ESPN in Brazil, if you see it, it's like 50-50 between, uh, you know, basketball and soccer and like it's 50% esports. Like they're showing all kinds of esports on ESPN there. Um, there's, Europe has always had a, a really thriving audience. Um, and I, and I think like it's it's only going to get bigger just as you know more and more people play video games. Yeah, and I have kind of two questions um, that, that follow up from that. Um, th the first is what, you know what does it take to 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 produce something like you know, like Worlds or you know or just even a sort of a you know like a weekly LCS stream for an, an international audience. Um, and this one might be the harder question. You know in in terms of the sort of the, the international future of this of this phenomenon, where do you sort of where do you see it growing? Do you see sort of you know certain parts of the world as as sites of, of, of primary growth? Are you kind of looking to to expand into untapped markets? What's mm -hmm. the sort of the I mean, if you're sort of imagining outwards, where yeah. do you sort of think it's heading? Well, the first question of what it takes to produce something of that scale, like I was. I was there, but I was in a truck uh, behind the scenes, and there were there were many trucks behind the scenes, and you need to have a lot of friends, um, a lot of partners. Um, it, it, when we go into a different region, um, we couldn't have done what we did in China without a really strong uh, Riot China team, um, as well as some of the logistical support that they have with partners there. Um, we have very uh, strong partnerships here as well that like we traveled a, a significant team there. Um, and, and then there are teams around the globe that are taking these signals and doing their own broadcasts, whether it's in, it's in Turkey or Brazil or you know, Russia. There are teams all over the world that are doing their own broadcasts. So it, it takes a, a pretty significant uh, footprint on the ground there, especially in a show of that size. But we do shows of, of various sizes. And I think like um, one thing that, when you see that, it does seem like bigger is better. Like, and that is like that is like a takeaway that, like, as far as being awestruck by a site, um, watching drone shots go over the bird's nest and, and those lights, like, feels very uh, spectacular and magnificent. And, and I think that it was. But I've seen shows uh, in front of 500 people. Uh, I've seen shows in front of 2,000 people. Some of my favorite shows and venues. Um, we did Chicago at the Chicago Theater, and uh, I had done work there before, and I kind of have a nostalgic uh, place in my, in my heart for this theater. It's a great theater, but it, it held about 4,000 people, um, but it was a vibrant crowd. And I think, uh, it's funny, uh, I've always been fascinated with sports and fascinated uh, with live events of sports. Um, I grew up in a house where uh, my parents were big sports fans. Uh, my dad was much more of a historian in his sports passion, and my mom is a psychopath about sports, and she <laughs> uh, raised five sons to like be excited about sports. And I've seen all my life, I've been fascinated by live sporting events, whether it was uh, the Harlem Globetrotters at the local community college when I was a kid, or the Warriors and their summer league uh, at the local community college, or even the local community college, playing at the local community college. I've always loved going to sports events, go to rodeos, I'd go to whatever I could get my eyes on. When I came, uh, I came on a road trip with a friend down here um, in 1988 and went to a basketball game at the, the pit here. Um, and it's surprising how much that's influenced much of the work that I've done since. I didn't know it at the time. Uh, UC Santa Barbara was playing UNLV. Uh, it, it was, UNLV was the second ranked team in the, in the country. Um, they had a guy named Stacy Ogman and Gerald Patio, and they were going to become number one the, that day because the number one had lost. And I didn't know what I was getting into. We went to this game, and I saw 5,000 students stand the entire game and not sit down. Maybe at halftime they'd sit down. But they stood the entire game. It was the most vocal and excited audience I've ever seen. And you see Santa Barbara upset UNLV. And it was great. Uh, they did it again two years later and put the only loss on UNLV's otherwise undefeated national championship season. But even when I'm in rooms now and we're talking about venues that we're going into, seeing what 5,000 people could do in a right-sized space 
had as profound of, uh, an impact on me as uh, Super Bowls that I've worked at and, and other things where there are 40,000 attendees. It's a different experience, but it's not a lesser experience or a greater experience by the number. The right size room, the right size passion, the event inspiring people to you know, be excited about things and what the game gives you uh, are often huge factors in like how, how great the event is. This, this event surprised me because um, I'm not biased for teams. I'm super biased about the North American uh, LCS because <laughs> I think that North America is the best and I'm always about North America and January to May is really our time to shine because it's a brand new year, everything's optimistic, and we haven't played anybody internationally yet, <laughs> and so I'm just gonna maintain my positive outlook uh, as long as I can. But the thing I do root for is I want moments, I want series, I want five games, I want, I want it going and I want those stories. It's something that uh, when I worked at Fox Sports very much changed in me because before, if the UCLA Bruins were losing, or the Giants were losing, or the 49ers were losing, I was mad, and I was, it ruined my day, and I was angry about it. But when I got into working in sports, and it being my profession, I saw times when teams that I loved lost, but I didn't care because it was a great walk-off home run, and it was a moment. And I've always just loved moments, and that's what I see in esports, and I would have thought that I would have hated to see uh, a sweep in the World Final. But SKT being the dominant force that they were, and this team who had been smashed by them, actually they came back and made it a series and almost did it, and then lost and had their dreams crushed at Staples Center. To see them one year later absolutely smash the thing that had like, kept them down felt great. It was a great story. And so stories come in a lot of different shapes and uh, media platforms and you know, a lot of it is like 15 second, uh, you know, clips that you see now, but story's the thing that's consistent throughout. And as platforms change and media changes and everything else, it's stories that re resonate with us. Um, part of my growth as a, like a young kid watching sports, it was much more appointment viewing when I grew up. Uh, I would go home, on, I would be home on Saturdays and I'd come in from outside, but I'd watch ABC's Wide World of Sports. A wide world of sports, they actually said it in their title sequence, they're spanning the globe, and it'd be a wrestling match you know, in Turkey, or it would be a, a slalom in, in Switzerland, or it would be all these variety of sports, but like that title sequence, if you ever look it up on YouTube, you can do wide world of sports title sequence, it had some drums, and it had some footage, and it always had the line like they were bringing you the thrill of victory, and the agony of defeat. And when it said the agony of defeat, this skier who'd crashed like went off, like I, I, I don't know if he died, he might have, like it was a horrible <laughs> accident, but it was like, that's the agony of defeat. And we see it, I don't think he died, but it was, a, it, was a, it was a horrible, it was a horrible crash, but like that's always impacted me that like there is no joy without loss and there is no, you know, that, that is kind of the stories that we tell and that's what we get in esports that excites me a lot. Yeah. Interesting. Um, you said something earlier, and I, I think that kind of you know helps us segue into the next clip, which is you know the, it's the, the sort of the energy of the audience, and it's not the sort of the, the, the size of the venue necessarily. And so we're going to sort of not to call the, the the battle arena a small venue, but it, compared to the bird's nest, it's, it's certainly small it's compared smaller. to the bird's nest. Uh, so we're going to turn to now is uh, is a clip from uh, from from the NALCS uh, from this this most recent season, um, and I'm I'm. When we get back, I, I want to ask you kind of about, um, you know, about, ab about producing for the NALCS and the sort of the, um, the battle arena here in, yeah. in Los Angeles. Oh. I mean, so in watching that, I'm, I'm struck by the sort of the, you know, the, the, just the different phases that production moves through. And so mm. you, we, we start the clip in, in one sort of production space with these, these analysts kind of predicting the, the entire scope of the day and then move to... Um, to focus on the game in, in another sort of part of the studio. And then uh, what's really fascinating is, is I, I think all of the different ways that the, you know, the, that the game gets mediated then for, for an audience. And so we're, we're going to replays and you're, we're looking at, uh, you know, at, at several things happening sort of simultaneously on the map with you know, picture in picture. And so, so I'm curious, you know, what does it take to, you know, to, to, to take a video game and sort of mm -hmm. and, and translate it um, for an audience in terms of the sort of the, the production 
space. Yeah. So the production you see is very complex, but behind the scenes there are so many people working um, to help uh, make the pr the broadcast look really good. The um, behind this is the live production team who's not part of the broadcast but actually is just running the game on the tournament realm like they're getting all the players like making sure the, the game is sound um, the referees are on stage working with the teams letting them know their time um, behind the scenes there are a lot of people both on the broadcast team and off the broadcast team helping facilitate to make sure that the the event and the game is going well uh, within the broadcast team um, we, we've grown a lot and we've, we've changed a lot, but one thing that Riot has always very much emphasized, and I think uh, to their credit and, and also to the benefit of the product, is uh, making sure that players are the ones that are making these decisions. Like the, the director of the broadcast is a former pro player, um, Clark Smith, who, uh, you know, he was a player and he kind of got the end of his career. He joined us and he's one of the observers. Uh, and he was really good at observing and communicating and, and some of the quick decision making and we gave him the opportunity to study you know kind of uh, at the feet of another director and learn from him and now he does that our observers are all high level players and the people making most of the decisions on the broadcast know the game really well because uh, everybody plays when i first arrived the this team was doing both the NALCS and the EU LCS from uh, LA we were in a studio at the time not in Santa Monica but down in Manhattan Beach and we had a control room there but we were doing the EU LCS the NA LCS uh, different teams but all kind of the the same people uh, the caster team was just four people at the time uh, it was the old four of uh, Riv, Freak, Kobe and Jat uh, and it's grown over time uh, Kim Van Norman is a, is a talent manager we have and she and uh, the head of esports, Waylon Rosell, had put this team together. It was very exciting for me because I've worked in uh, entertainment and sports, and some of the big personalities can be a little bit diva esque. And so when I got into esports, these guys were so passionate and so engaged, and like almost, I don't want to say devoid of, of ego, but they certainly were humble in, in their approach to work and, and their passion showed. And, and the team's grown, but one thing that's been consistent is making sure that. Uh, we're using people who know the game, who are players, who understand it. Um, and then there's a lot that goes on. Um, I'm not as involved on the, on the daily production. We have uh, uh, three producers who are mostly doing this. Um, they'll collaborate so that uh, Countdown, which was the analyst desk, where we, we start games now at the, right at the top of the hour. The Countdown is produced by a producer named Asa Doné, who uh, does great work for us. Um, Arthur Chandra, uh, we call him the mayor. Uh, he was in one of the first videos, but he's uh, producing the show as well as uh, Emin Frazier. And these guys, we've, we've been able to build and develop a team, taking gamers, taking players, taking League of Legends players who are aggressive and willing to learn and want to like, you know, bring this to an audience. And, and we've been able to level them up from a broadcast pers perspective. It's been very exciting for me to be involved in that work to uh, kind of like grow people in different roles and see um, that one thing we found was that we could get very high-end directors who you know might work you know the Academy Awards and sports shows and Super Bowls and they're very they're obviously from a craft perspective very very good at what they do but then we could take gamers who really understood what's going on in the game and we could teach them the craft end but it's harder to teach you know someone that doesn't know the game what's going on in the game and to have to tell them Hey, Afro Moon Double Lift uh, used to be teammates. They were really good friends, and now they're on different teams. Make sure you're shooting that during the handshake. I don't have to tell Clark Smith that, or Yet Win, or JD Wu. Those guys know the game. They've been playing in the game. They they have all the stories. So it's really everybody kind of understanding and being aligned and knowing how to work things. Some of the picture in picture uh, goes back to um, what we had talked about um, with bringing the players into the game. One thing I really like doing is that we're showing a lot more facial reactions so that, you know, after an Apollo Baron steal or something, we're going to his player cam. We're getting good reactions on the top of replays. And so our observer team, our live edit team, uh, and our graphics team, they're all working together as, as Clark calls the shots. Uh, those guys like uh, Josh Miller's working our live edit. He's a producer in there. And he'll say, hey, I've got a great reaction on Bjergsen, like after this play. And, he, he, you know, then the word gets to the observers who are doing a replay, 
and the reserves know that, hey, we've got a reaction coming off of uh, EVS, which is the live edit software we're using, um, and then Clark will know, they'll call for it, he'll, he'll say, hey, we've got a reacts, roll the replay, the observers will say, they'll count down, re the end of replay in three, two, one, roll EVSA, roll it, take a reaction, and it's like just bringing in that story element to make it personalized and so that it's not just champions. Most of the audience, like we said, are gamers, and so like Mitch and I, were, we're, I'm bad at the game. Like I play a lot, and I've played a lot over the last five years. I'm still a silver, today I'm a silver three jungler. Yesterday I was a silver two jungler. But uh, you know, I, I play thousands of ranked games every year and I love playing. My skill level is only so high, but like even watching that, even without the human element, like when we see, you know, a champion get chunked for two thirds of its health because of a, a crit, like, you know, that means something. That's like, wow, like that's, that's impressive. And, um, that's why we, we want to uh, make sure that you know, players are telling stories. And really the audience is something uh, also like, um, when we talk about influences, we're influenced so much by the audience. And it's, it's great to have, I wanna be careful about saying that Twitch chat is great, because <laughs> Twitch chat often is not great. But there are times when you're getting a real immediate reaction to the work that you're doing, and you're able to like, see fun, see memes, people telling Joel to get on Skype and, and TSM cheers, but you, you get kind of a, like an immediate response as well as, as Reddit and like we try to engage with the, with the players and with the community because that's such an important part of what we do is audience connection. If, if we think that what we're doing is good and we're out of touch with the people that we are hoping to, will watch it, it's gonna be a failure, uh, but if we're you know, receptive and responsive and engaged and having those conversations and knowing what's exciting and, and seeing like the, uh, the, the community respond to something like LCS Pigeon, for instance, like that's, a, like that's great for us. We, you know, there's that spontaneity in esports, that lightheartedness and some of the memes that things just happen sometimes and like that becomes a story. When a pigeon landed on the stage in Vancouver, um, it was a, it was funny because every like suddenly LCS Pigeon had a Twitter account and like people had posters celebrating LCS Pigeon and um, the venue uh, asked us if they wanted like they were worried about the pigeon and whether or not they we wanted them to uh, bring a hawk in to uh, take the pigeon out overnight and we we're like no like please like email the please no this is one of our fans like but, but we uh, like we embrace that. And I don't like it when like, there's a commentary like, oh, this is more exciting than the match. That's not why we embrace it. We embrace it because players embrace it. And it's fun, and it's lighthearted, and it's something going on around the event that uh, the community embraces, and we do too, so it's fun. Um, two things. I, I like that you mentioned silver. I actually, I've been playing since 2010. I just got to silver this week, so. Nice. Big, <laughs> big moves over here. Congratulations. Um, but I, I think the, the sort of this, this question of the audience is, um, is, a, is a really great way, I think, to, to translate to the last the part of our Q&A, which should you know, be, be questions from the audience. I know we have a, a bunch of, I think, avid fans here, but I think also just a bunch of people curious about what's going on with eSports. Yeah, for sure. So China got lots of league players. However, there are lots of new games rising every single day, like PUBG, Players Unknown Battleground, and uh, Overwatch, things like that. And all this game, they all have their own league, like they have own championship. Yep. I just want to ask, do you think that um, this new um, championship, this new competition, will have a positive or a negative influence on leagues um, League's uh, competition, do you think like it will reduce the number of audience or in increase it? Because in China, like every time a new game arises, they will say that, oh, oh my God, League is dead. It's yeah. like, it will dead this time. Oh, if, if it, but it, it didn't, but every single time, like people yeah. talk about it, they say like um, people are getting less passionate uh, about the game. So I w just want to like if like, what do you think about others' uh, competitions influence on, league and how if 
you have a negative influence, how you guys keep the audience passionate about the league instead of other games? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, and, it's, and it's one that uh, we do a lot of like thinking about and reflecting about. Um, we never want to be dismissive or um, unaware of like our competition and also what we can learn from what we're seeing around us. Uh, you've mentioned China and that is very much a, a very competitive space right now. Uh, Korea often, um, you know, the, the, the PC bong play rates of what's being played almost reads like a stark, uh, stock market watch where, um, you know, like there, there was a week or two where league was surpassed and it had been to top dog for so long and Overwatch passed it and it was the end of League of Legends and, 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 and then, you know, Overwatch came back down and things um, returned. It, it's, not a, um, it's not a space where we are not just the biggest but the only competitor anymore. And to me, that's exciting. Like, to me, that's a challenge. Uh, I've, I've been involved in, in projects before where um, I, was been, I was working on the clear number two, and we were chasing a number one. And like, some of that was very stimulating because you were willing to take more chances, and you knew where you wanted to be. Uh, some of what we've done w with Lowell Esports has been difficult because we have been at the top, and we don't want to stay idle and, and just be complacent with where we are. We want to keep moving. And so we haven't had that like, oh, those guys, we want to do what they're doing. We've had to kind of constantly look at reinventing, reevaluating what we do. But overall, I think the competition is only stimulating for the space overall, and it will make us better at what we do, and hopefully it's making them better at what they do. Um, a person I was talking to the other day was asking me why, um, why the Beatles were so good, and he, like he concluded that it was because of the competitive music scene at that time. Like you had to be top notch to be better than others, and I think that that's that's how I feel about esports right now. I see it in the competition and the gaming with teams, and some of them having been very. Uh, you know, secretive about their information. And I think there are actually gains to be made strategically about a more open uh, understanding of strategy and, and where it's going. But from a Lowell Esports perspective and like broadcast numbers, um, I'm excited that there are challengers in the space. And I'm, I'm excited that uh, when I see others doing things that some of what I see like reminds me of what we're doing and like they've obviously seen that, but some of what they're doing is different and unique. and. And I want to be able to learn from that, and I want to keep challenging our team to you know, be at that next level and keep moving. But it's a great question. Thank you. When you guys uh, first announced that you wanted to do franchising, that you wanted to put an emphasis on having more career longevity as well as branding management. And I recently read from your um, article about player management from Riot that you guys do hold workshops sometimes for the players to increase their social media presence. However, like uh, looking right now at teams like Golden Guardians, uh, you don't really see as much media presence as compared to TSM or Cloud9. So I wanted to know how much responsibility does Riot expect from franchise team owners to actually um, help their players increase their presence and, um, I guess, player like notoriety? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and it's one that uh, is very much talked about. And like we're in those conversations, we're thinking about it. Like we want them all to be incredible. Uh, and we want them all to be doing it all on their own and, and you know, hitting a certain mark. But we also understand that this is a long-term relationship and dynamic with these teams. And we're not in a place where we're impatient, where we're not telling Golden Guardians like, hey, you need to do this better like right now. Um, different teams are doing like different things better. Um, some teams uh, have great content teams, uh, 100 Thieves. Like I was really, really impressed with the work that they were doing and some of their behind the scenes doc doc work. Uh, Team Liquid is also very similar to that. Um, but like that is one component of like what we're hoping franchises begin to take on it for themselves and, and grow and develop. And I think that in, in many ways uh, there's a time for social prominence and brand development and then there's a time for team development. And I, I'm not an expert on Golden Guardians. I know the team. I cover the team. We do that but I'm not behind you know, the scenes of what they're doing, 
but I do know people with the organization. I've talked to them a little bit, and I think that their focus right now is getting their team to a place where it where it's you know in a competitive sense where they want it to be, and I think that's the focus. Where if you go with the messaging before the product is right, like it can be a risk, and so. I'm not saying that's what it is in that case, but I think that their primary focus is becoming more competitive this summer and b continuing to grow. They knew that when they put the lineup that they did together, they knew it was a young lineup and they knew it had potential. And I think their focus is very much uh, on the roster development. Whereas a team like 100 Thieves, you've got such veteran players, you have people like Aframu and Medios, and you know that they're gonna be at a certain caliber of play and so you can probably take advantage of the fact they have great personalities and do awesome content. So brand and content and social engagement and like even things like their team situation and like what kind of uh, house they're in. It's funny because in the Team Liquid piece three years ago, many of the teams were still all in the team house working and that model seems to be uh, disrupted right now and that teams are choosing to say like, hey, let's come to work together and then let's go home. <laughs> and like, then when we come to work together, we're not all sick of seeing each other because you know you took the last of the Cheerios and like, how are we gonna have bot lane synergy when we're mad about what happened in the kitchen this morning? So like, th that's kind of a growth and development I think teams are taking on for themselves, their practice facilities. Um, and, and the other component of that is the player association, which was exciting that you know Riot came together with, with the NALCS and these owners came together with franchising, and then uh, they, there's also been a player association put together kind of for the protection and looking out for players and making sure that their hopes are being represented um, at more than just a team and, and owner level. Because I'm a really big football and traditional sports fan, and I was, I'm also a huge NALCS fan, and I kind of see my, those two fandoms in different ways, like mm -hmm. for football, I'm gonna die a Packers fan, but even though I've been watching NALCS since like its inception, I feel like I don't have a team so much as players I root for a lot. So like if Double Lift is on any team, I'll be like, oh, awesome! I'm a Liquid fan now, or yeah. I was a TSM fan. So we kind of touched on the personal branding and stuff like that earlier, but I kind of wanted to get your take as someone who's kind of been in traditional sports a lot. Why do you think? Yeah. There's such big differences there. It's a great, it's a great question, and a great observation, really. Like it's something I've noticed as well. Uh, if you look at that first video we saw, like that, uh, there was a, a, a young young lady in it who was like, "I love you, Team Liquid," and you saw like she was wearing a C9 shirt, right? <laughs> and um, you know there are fans that are regulars and like. Sometimes, you know, we're like, oh, there's a jersey swapper. Because in between the games, like, the jerseys are being swapped. And, I, and I, I'm not saying that from a judgmental perspective. It's something that's a great observation. I think that uh, one thing I've noticed is that uh, Packers fans are ride or die with the Packers, right? You're not like, all right, now I'm a Cowboys fan. Uh, but esports fans are very different in that. And I think part of it is the love of the game that, like, League fans love league. They love watching people play league at the highest level. They like the personalities like the double lift or, or something like that. And they're there for the experience. Um, I'm hoping that there comes a time when that, that affiliation with the team and the team brand and who they are is a little bit more core. But uh, for instance, like when we have a sellout at Staples Center between Samsung and SKT, uh, or when we have a sellout at the bird's nest between Samsung and SKT, it's the same all the time, as far as the teams, like those aren't 50% Samsung fans and 50% SKT fans, or even 60-40 or anything like that. Those are league fans. And I think when they're there that day, they have, I'm, I'm going for SKT today, or I'm going for Samsung, but they're League of Legends fans. Uh, it wasn't that they all traveled from Seoul because they're a booster club for SKT. It's that they're League of Legends and little esports fans and they like seeing that from, from that perspective. And um, I think it will change over time. I know some like ride or die CLG fans and sometimes you know, that's kind of a, like a, a up and down trajectory for them sometimes and, you know, uh, and, and others. But um, I am seeing more fans that like stay in the course whether their team has a bad split or not. 
TSM is, is so funny to me because like that's the biggest brand, uh, definitely in North America, maybe globally, but I can be in Brazil uh, watching a game that doesn't include TSM and a Brazilian crowd will break out into a TSM chant <laughs> because they like to be ironic or Mimi or something. But um, so some of the brand allegiance exists. I think you see it with the EU's final this year with G2 and Fnatic. Like, there was a lot of interest in that because that's the old guard and those are traditional teams. And part of the process, like, maybe that um, a TL100 Thieves final at this juncture is not, as, is not as promotional or marketable as a TSM C9 final. And so for the short term, that may be like, you know, harsh, but for the long term, I think it's completely healthy. I'm really excited about seeing a Team Liquid banner in the LCS arena because there's only been CLG, C9, and TSM banner, lots of TSM banners. Um, and so, you know, having new teams up there is, is gonna be really exciting for me. And I'm excited about seeing these teams, now that they're permanent partners, kind of grow and develop in that way where people are like, you know what, I'm a, I'm a Golden Guardians fan, that team's super cool, and I like the Bay Area, or, or you know, something along those lines. Like, wh whatever it is that attaches a team, a player to a team, for, for many of us, and that's another big question, is like the regional tie-in of like localization. Like, you're probably a Packers fan, either because you maybe were from that area or someone that you cared about was from that area. You know what I mean? Like we, a lot of it is like even family-based. Um, I'm a Giants fan because I don't want to disappoint my mom. <laughs> so. I'm from LA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a fantastic question to end on. Yeah. Um, I, I'd, I'd like everybody to, to give me a hand in, in, uh, in thanking Dave yeah. for, for coming out and Thank you. talking to us. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I appreciate you inviting me, and I appreciate all of you uh, hanging out and listening. Like these are these are fun topics to me. And I saw that uh, some of you had hands up uh, that might have had questions. Um, I'll be glad to talk to you uh, at, at the reception if there's anything I can answer. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone else. Thanks. Thanks.